Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for this introduction. Thanks a lot for for the invitation to talk here. And I'm actually really happy about the, the workshop, and uh, I'm looking forward also to the discussions over the day today. I think it's a really important topic to look into interpretability in uh, um, in clinical decision support and. Uh, I, I put Mara's name first here because much of what, we're, what I'm presenting is also based on her work. So it's actually pretty difficult to present just after her um, because she really started uh, uh, bringing the topic to our research group. So we've been working on clinical decision support for over 20 years now in, in a variety of, uh, of, of domains. So mainly starting in radiology, but in the last uh, seven, eight years, we've had a lot more work on histopathology. And I think in both domains, we've really seen a changes of technologies and how this actually influences also our, our way of, uh, of dealing with that. I put up a picture here, which is not an interpretability, but it's just an illustration of uh, some of the work we've done in the past. And I think even visualizations can, can actually help to understand data. And I think it's important to, uh, to give this kind of feedback to clinicians who have an overload of data and need to take decisions. And all of that is not black and white. Most of the time, when they take decisions, they really have to integrate a lot of data and quite often also the personal situation. I mean, if you look at cancer, you can operate or not, or you can take different types of therapies. But sometimes it really depends more on the person than uh, not, not only on the status of the disease, for example. And yeah, this work is also funded by AI for Media, an EU-funded uh, initiative that both Mara and I are working with. Let's see. So uh, this is a bit of the outline for the talk. So I have to fill, I think, 45 minutes. So we have some time for discussions as well. <laughs> and I will start a little bit with what we've been doing actually in, in decision support. And what is it that explainability or interpretability brings us? And then um, I will also look a little bit at some of the terms that Mara had mentioned before as well, because I think it's quite important to actually look at what do we want and what are the differences in, in what we're doing. And also, in which way these things are related, but also they're related to the person actually using the system. So when we use the system with a clinician, they might need different information than if we use it with like a patient, for example, to, to explain uh, to them something about, uh, about the disease. And I think th these kind of things I would, I would like to talk a little bit about. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of work on classical machine learning, and people often say, well, classical machine learning is understandable because we use handcrafted features, and then we use like k-nearest neighbors or simple like uh, distance functions, some of the things we can relatively easily understand, and uh, but not everything is as interpretable. Like if we look at radiomics, some of the features, I think people can easily understand an average gray level in an area of a tumor. It's, it's, it's easy to understand, but some of the more complex texture features are not that easy to understand. And some of the things that we have been doing, so I will talk a little bit about, uh, about this. And then the main part is really about the deep learning because that's really what I think everything is now about. And uh, that's what we mainly use. But I think it's sometimes good to also look a step back. And then I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to discussions, conclusions, and uh, what other people think. Um, I put up that slide, but I think that is already <clears throat> all mentioned. So I don't need to talk about that too much. I mean, what I wanted to stress is really that everything I'm presenting here is it's, it's teamwork. So it's uh, we have a large group of people working on different aspects. And uh, I think I'm really very much inspired by this. And uh, it's, it's really interesting. It's cool to work in this team. And I mean, we're in Valais. So if anybody wants to come and visit us, really beautiful. So the Matterhorn that Mara used is very close to our offices. So it's actually a nice place to come to. Um, so what, what have we been doing in, in, in clinical decision support? So over the last 20 years, we've done a lot of work in radiology, looking at uh, our multimodal data analysis. So looking at images, interpreting, like understanding what is in the image, machine learning on images using detection. And there's an example of like a, uh, interstitial lung diseases, where we quantify different tissue patterns, where we try to visualize them in different ways, which is also something giving additional information to a clinician that he does not have when he just goes through the axial slices of, uh, of the CT. What we're trying to do is also integrate clinical data, structured data, what we can get out of uh, clinical text, and look at like what are the links between uh, these different items that, uh, that we have. And then um, um, I've put an image play here. So we're, we're running scientific challenges, creating data sets, open data, where people can really compare their algorithms. And that's also something that I find is really 
important in terms of transparency to look at like what algorithms would work well in what situation on what type of data, because it's, it's not that easy to do that. And uh, in a way, what we're trying to do is really help the clinicians to integrate all of the data that they have to then take uh, the best informed uh, decisions or qu quite often quantitative information because clinicians are usually very good qualitatively to integrating data. But now if we have multiple images with many different protocols that are produced, um, we have genetic data. I mean, there's uh, so much data that clinicians need to integrate that often in complex oncological cases, for example, it's actually really difficult to, to, to take the best decisions and uh, uh, in terms of uh, diagnosis, treatment, but then also a treatment response, monitoring treatment response, for example. And uh, initially we started a lot on radiology, but now we're doing actually a lot of histopathology. We're also trying to combine the two because there are many links be between these, uh, these, these domains. And this is just like uh, this visualization that we put up in 3D, which actually has uh, much more, I mean, we initially started with the uh, um, quantifying information in the 2D, but then the visualization interactively playing with that uh, actually really helped to make it much, much faster to get the whole case in, uh, in, in a few seconds. And when we started to implement, there was a lot of like reluctance of clinicians saying like, oh, if we, um, uh, if we put up like decision support, you put a barrier between us and the patient. So we're looking at the screen, we're not uh, taking care of the patient anymore. And actually I think that positioning, I mean, this is about 15 years old and I think it's changed quite a bit because now they actually want this decision support. They want quantitative information and they're also using it to show it to the patient. But this is where when we look at interpretability, when we look at visualizations of data, looking at prognosis, et cetera, I think we need to pay attention to, to whom we address because uh, explainability uh, for a clinician is different than explainability for a patient. And even within clinicians, I mean, we've been working on finding similar uh, cases, for example, for clinicians to do differential diagnosis. So if they have a case where they're not sure about, they can look at different other cases. Depending on the specialty, we would need to like, very different variety of cases actually to do to differential diagnosis. Somebody who's really a specialist in an area would need a much finer focus, whereas if somebody is not so much a specialist, more general physician, it would need a much broader uh, 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 combination of cases to do that. So it's really something to look into whom are we talking about? And I think that's also something that I would like to talk about later on, but how we can actually evaluate interpretability and, and what we're doing. Because those are my, my next steps um, that I would like to work on. Motivation for what we're doing is really, I mean, digital medicine is reality. Everything is digital. There's a lot of machine learning. Most hospitals that we work with are implementing machine learning tools. Often, with, I mean, not everything works well. Um, quite often, it's, I mean, there's too many false positives, for example, and then it takes time. But sometimes they have these one or two cases where, or like a cerebral bleeding, if it is detected and uh, by an algorithm was maybe missed by a clinician, it could have severe consequences. And th that happens. On the other hand, it also takes additional time. It's expensive. So the question is, do, do we invest more into people or more into, into algorithms? I think uh, that's what's currently going on. And in that implementation, the integration into clinical practice, I think explainability, interpretability is really important because like that, people can really get things quicker and, uh, and, and find out about that because it needs to be integrated with uh, uh, the other information. The clinician in the end uh, is the, the person who has like the responsibility for the decision making. So they need to get what, uh, what we want to have. And I think also here like uh, uncertainty, causality, I mean, concepts that also Mara mentioned, I think are, are really important to look into. So when we look at uh, medical data, and I took a step back, and uh, so I think this is one of the earliest cases I, I found about very systematic medical data analysis. And it's a Broad Street cholera outbreak in London in, I think, 1854. And there was a, everybody thought, I mean, that uh, uh, it was linked to foul air, because I think at the time, big cities just smelled very badly because there was no like sewer systems, everything went directly into the Thames and also fresh water came directly out of the river. And there was a physician who actually took the time and he took all of the cases, I mean, there are plenty of black dots. So he put them on the map. And what he realized that there's like one pumping station that all the cases sort of meander around. And if people go to a different water station, a different pump, uh, they seem to be not getting cholera. So they turned off that pump, disabled it, and it disappeared. So they realized it was linked to water. 
And um, I mean, this is just a visualization. Uh, and But I think what we can see is by visualizing data, by having additional cues in, in this respect, we can, we can actually help decision making and we can put it on a much more solid basis. I also want to say a few critical words about, I mean, everybody said, oh, we can predict everything. I mean, there was Google flu trends that really worked well until it didn't work anymore. <laughs> and, and I mean, there's a couple of articles written about it. And it, uh, it, it just means that if you have a model, I mean, behavior of people changes over time. And at some point, I mean, it just completely overestimated it. And it's, it's something to take into account that whatever we have also in hospitals, we're looking at changing data constantly. I mean, machines are being replaced, new protocols are being introduced. So we need continuous learning, continuous adaptations. I think static models, I mean, work at their time, but data really, we're not, we're hitting at a moving target. And I think that's something also to, to take into account. And I mean, I took a couple of examples from the media and how machines are better than humans and uh, Google DeepMind beats, uh, in, I mean, there's a variety of things hype exaggeration. There's also a lot of like criti critical things like uh, for iFundus image is worked really well on like static data when they tried to use it in a real clinic because then it didn't work. And I mean, these are kind of things we need to understand why, because I think there's a lot of potential, but we, we really need to look into what we're doing. And I mean, patients want to see a real person. They don't want to get AI tools. I mean, that's something that's maybe changing. There's a lot of discussion about ChatGPT. People realize, I mean, some things it's really cool. Others, well, you need to judge the quality of it. Just about the critical things. So there's, a, for those who want to, it's, it's a YouTube, it's on YouTube. So it's a video of Jeff Hinton from, I think, 2016, where he mentions that radiology is over the cliff and we should stop training radiologists instantly because within five years, AI will do anything, everything radiologists will do. We're now, I think, six or seven years after that, uh, that workshop and it's not, it's not happening. And I mean, there are many challenges in AI in, in the medical field. And uh, it, even though sometimes the performance is really bluffing, it's really good on very specific tasks, putting it into a broader context is difficult. And that's why we need the AI to find the bias, the bias in the data. I mean, we have uh, gender bias. There's so many different biases that we have uh, that uh, we need to take into account. And this is a really interesting book for everybody who wants to work in clinical decision support. They look into, it's, I think it's also 15, 20 years old, but they had a systematic analysis of civil health records in US hospitals and based extrapolating what they found in these hospitals was that there's about, I think, 150,000 deaths due to uh, er medical errors in US hospitals that are documented. I mean, that's, that's a lot per year. So it's, it's a very large number. And um, in many of these cases could actually be avoided if there's very simple, sometimes simple rule-based decision support would actually be sufficient to, uh, to get this done. And uh, I think that's something to look into. I mean, they did extrapolation for Switzerland. I think it's a few thousand cases, a few thousand deaths a year, avoidable errors in uh, due to medical mistakes actually that are done in, in the hospitals. I mean, I think you already showed that definition of interpretability. I think it's important to look into uh, uh, the definitions. I mean, there's one in, in the paper that Mara mentioned about the taxonomy of interpretable AI. Um, this is one of Ben King that, uh, that I put up. I also took like some uh, trends of explainable language. Mean, also the workshop shows there's a lot of interest. I think it's an important topic. And I think people also realize how complex it is, how many different things there are, how much work actually needs to be done. And there are different definitions of interpretable AI explainability. Um, again, I put up a couple of, uh, of references and some of it is taken from, from Wikipedia. But I think what's important is there's this question of a human. So we need to look at like how we can, how a human can understand the cause and how a human can predict the model results. And that's why there's not one size fits all, but we really need to look at like who, who, whom are we talking to? And uh, I think that's important. And again, classical machine learning, we basically model human knowledge. And in, in a way, it makes it easier to understand it because we're starting with uh, human knowledge. I mean, 
when we look at interpretability, quite often we're also looking how to explain it to a human. So we're getting away from something fully automatic where the machine does everything. But I mean, medicine still uses many, in many ways, there are decision trees that are used and uh, you want to have like clear outlines of what are, uh, what, what is the data, what happens, so you can actually reproduce absolutely everything. And that is something with deep learning that completely changed. And I think with uh, uh, deep learning basically being used everywhere for clinical decision support, it has much better results. So it really uh, uh, adapts to the data, but that also means that we have millions of parameters. I mean, when we look at classical machine learning with this curse of dimensionality, so quite often we don't want to have more than what, 15, 20 dimensions. And uh, here we're talking of millions or billions of parameters that, that large models actually use. And I think it's important that we look at, uh, even though the performance is very, very good, we also need to understand why it sometimes doesn't work or how it works, actually. I mean, we had uh, um, once classifying pancreas into like in, uh, with pancreatitis or not. And then we looked actually, we just had a simple graph come of, we realized that actually the heat map, like the uh, area that was taken into account was not at all in the organ. <laughs> so I mean, that's not what you want to see when you visualize your results. Um, but actually the, there were systematic changes when there was an infection that the pancreas was actually moving. So we were actually looking at, at some points uh, where it was not in the organ, but it was systematic. And, that's something that you can find, but that doesn't mean that it will always work. So it's still important, even though it, it, it works to, to take that into account. And I mean, now with uh, generative models, I mean, this is not medical, but uh, if you want to look at a dog or a dolphin, I mean, you can generate anything in between. So if we, if we want to do classification, we want to look at classes, so when does it switch? I mean, that's something to take into account. And we, use, we can use similar concepts also when we generate medical images or when uh, we want to take that into account. We can actually use that. That's a paper from archive uh, where they looked at like do an exaggeration in both ways as a method of interpretability. And we can use that for, is it a young person, an old person, and you can make them look younger or older with generative model. But you can use that also for, for medical concepts. Like this is, a, I think for an enlarged heart, for example, you can generate images and then you can actually compare uh, uh, whether the classification you have and the exaggerated models, whether it makes sense. And I think these, these kind of very simple things can actually, actually help in many, many situations. Um, so when we look at uh, uh, the, the, the deep learning explainabilities, it's really to, to remove the, 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 the black box image and uh, sort of understand what is happening inside the model. And uh, I mean, the, uh, the heat maps that I've shown here, uh, it's all around the tumor. So that's ex exactly what we would like to see that it actually, and, and in many cases that, that works well. I mean, we can see that the decisions are sound if it is on, uh, on the right area. Sometimes it's not that easy to understand. So sometimes when we we have like many little uh, heat, like in the, the heat map, we have many little areas in, in various parts of the image, then it actually becomes much, much harder to understand. But in medicine, I mean, we want to make sure that uh, uh, we, we do have these, uh, uh, these basic understandings because if we take wrong decisions, the impact is actually very high. So that's uh, uh, why it's important to be able to A, explain what the model does, what's happening inside the model, where the bias can come from and how we can take that into account. And um, I mean, this is too small to see. These are various definitions. I mean, I can share the slides so you can look at that in, in more details. Um, but there are many different, different definitions for the same terms. And there are actually many concepts that are related. And most often we talk about explainable, interpretable, but also understandable, in, intelligible, all of them basically depend on the user. Then we have transparency, which is related uh, to the other two. So if we can really fully understand what's happening in the model, we have algorithmic fairness or bias in, in the data, which usually happens. I mean, there, I mean, it's just important to understand what are the populations that we're dealing with. So in clinical trials, usually there's a much larger proportion of men, for example, uh, because they don't get pregnant and uh, like that they don't need to leave the, 
the, uh, the, the, the clinical trials, on the other hand, that might also mean that dosages or symptoms or whatever is actually uh, much more adapted to men. And that's something that we need to A, find out. And I think people are starting to be aware of that, that uh, actually many things don't, don't work like we want. And this bias in the data is actually really important. I mean, for um, heart attacks, for example, it's, it's much rarer in women but because all of the guidelines are based on symptoms of men, uh, it's actually mortality is much higher. And there's plenty of examples that, uh, that can be given for that. Then we have accountability, reliability, trustability, robustness. I mean, that's something that we want. We want our algorithms to be like that. All of that is related. And uh, um, all of that is something we need to take into account, like causality, uh, uncertainty, et cetera. And uh, this is actually the outcome of a, of a paper which is based on a workshop that uh, that uh, Mara co-organized uh, on like building a taxonomy of interpretable AI, and it's it's published in uh, Artificial Intelligence Reviews. Well, we looked at it from from many different perspectives. So from the more technical side, so we're more from the machine pure machine learning side, but then you can also look at it from like sociology, from a legal side, and look at it from more philosophical side. And it's actually interesting to see how the terms are related, how there are differences between the terms, the definitions, and how that can possibly impact things. I mean, and there's actually the legal side is quite interesting because the European Union is currently re reporting up many AI regulations and uh, also with the GDPR, I mean, about data usage. I mean, there's many things that are changing, for example, that we do have a right for, 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 for an explanation that we understand. So if your bank refuses your mortgage based on your data, they can just say, oh, uh, algorithm says you, you don't have a right to get that, but they need to be able to explain you why, why they're doing it. Why are you in a, in, a, in a higher risk category? And I think that's something that's really important. And the more AI tools are being used, the more it is important to take these things into account and really look at like ethical aspects as well. And so getting back a little bit to the classical pipeline of uh, uh, what we used to do for classical machine learning, so when we um, were developing a tool, so most of the time we started annotating data, look at like what kind of pretreatment normalization we need, then we extract visual features, we model these features, you know, like visual words or other aggregation methods. Um, if we have different modalities, we might do like uh, multimodal fusion, um, and then we have the classical classification detection retrieval task. Now with deep learning, much of this is in like one box, like the feature extraction, modeling, multimodal fusion, and image pretreatment. If we do like data augmentation, that's often, we don't really need that uh, that much. Um, but now we need to be able to actually look at like, if, we, if we're using these steps, we can control everything. And in that way, when we look at like handcrafted features, for example, we can use simple features that we easily understand. Um, I mean, we can also use deep learning based features, but then again, we have the problem of understanding how these features were actually created. We can use very low level features. I mean, as I said, like average gray level, everybody understands. When we look at more higher level features, when Gabor filters, it's gradients in different directions. It's also something that we sort of understand. When we look at uh, gray level co occurrence matrices, one of the most frequently used features in radiomics, for example, it gets harder. I mean, what does like 0 0.5 entropy in a specific direction, a specific uh, uh, um, distance actually means. I, I don't think people can really understand it. We have, might have a broad idea of what it means, but but I think it's very hard to get more into the uh, into the detail part. And then we have like shape, gray level, color, texture features. We might have global and uh, local features, so actually relationships between items. And the more we model it, the more we can take into account uh, human knowledge and the easier it might be to, to actually understand it. Um, yeah, but as I said, like uh, same thing for distance measures. I mean, some might have a clear meaning with can nearest neighbors and uh, uh, we might have a simple, like if you use a Euclidean distance, it might be easy to put that together. But like support vector machines, it starts getting a, a a bit more complex, whereas decision trees are very frequently used. And it's just an example of uh, a co-occurrence matrix for texture analysis where we can choose the parameters and, and very easily then, then get out what we would like to have in terms of, uh, of the features that we're having. Um, one thing that we developed uh, uh, in, in our group uh, 
We select texture analysis based on the Ries transform. So we're using a basic components that we can then combine to create filters to detect things. And this is something that was actually introduced for the interstitial lung diseases. Um, well, we can actually see that we have like specific detectors for specific tissues and you can sort of get a feeling for what it is like emphysema or micronodules or macronodules. So they, uh, you can actually use that as well. We showed that to clinicians and they said like, oh yeah, this seems to make sense. It makes sense when we have a very relatively homogeneous text. These are learned features. So we learn them, the combination of the different RIS filters based on the data, and then we can apply them to new tissue. Um, so we use that sort of as a method of explaining a model showing that it actually makes sense. But it makes sense if we have a single like homogeneous group. One problem we had here was, for example, a healthy tissue. We have a very broad representation. It's, 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 it's a very uh, heterogeneous group of, uh, of tissue because we try to get healthy tissue from most patients. But most of these patients we had with interstitial lung disease are relatively old, multimorbid, and they don't really have fully healthy tissues. So all of them have like little beginnings of abnormalities. So what we in, in the end realized is for this uh, group of healthy tissue, we would need uh, not only one class, but actually several classes to, to, to make it work. And then one um, oh, distance measures, I mean, Euclidean distance, easy to understand. This is like your city block or Manhattan distance. But then we have, again, some of the distances might be much harder. I mean, we know the, uh, uh, the capabilities, we know the, the theory behind them, but then if we uh, apply them, it might actually not be that easy. And same thing for uh, more complex ways of, uh, 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 of doing like uh, uh, the learning on them, I mean, can your neighbors again works often really well, particularly when we have clusters of uh, the same classes, whereas uh, uh, more complex parts like support vector machines are, are much harder to understand. And I'm now going to, to the main part and the deep learning part where we uh, really want to make sure by having actually by, by giving feedback to, to the users of our systems to make sure that. Uh, uh, we can see what's happened inside the model, what it, uh, what the decisions are based on, and what might happen also inside the data. What what are the problems that uh, that we have? And I mean, one of the things we have we make mostly work on images, but it's actually also important to look at like how can we explain text classification of text? How can we explain structured data? I mean, if we look at decisions, like if we look at ChatGPT, for example, where does the data come from? Can we actually show like why for a specific question, it generates a specific text, like how, what sources are taken into account? I mean, that's something that would be uh, quite interesting to, to actually get to. Um, and another part, I mean, Mara mentioned also the classification, we need to look at whether we want to actually find out more about the data we're using, bias that we have in the data, or really, uh, explain what is happening in inside the model. And we also need to check most of the time what we're doing is post hoc explanations. So we, we take existing models that have shown to really work well uh, on a task that we're doing. And then on top of that, we create explainability because like that we can really take the best models and on top of that add something. But uh, generating models that uh, are like per se uh, uh, interpretable or like glass models as uh, as he called it. I think that would definitely be one step further, and it 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 could really help also from the start to uh, to to make sure that uh, we're developing something that uh, that makes sense in this respect. And this is taken from uh, from a paper where, where this is like the, the model agnostic, uh, the model based interpretability. We have the the post hoc uh, uh, interpretability and the, the model specific parts. And I mean, there's a variety of techniques that we we can then use. Well, one way also to like uh, in a very easy way look at like what's happening inside the model is also like sort of visualizing what happens in in inside a deep neural network, like what does a specific layer channel look at? I mean, that's something that's been done quite often on natural images. There's a lot of work on ImageNet in, in, in that respect that we can take. And then here, these are the classical ones like 
class activation maps. And, and again, I mean, I've taken examples from the, the classical papers where we can easily see like whether that makes sense for the task that uh, that we're looking at. So it's it's, it's post hoc. It's it's uh, uh, it's on top of the data. And I mean, this is a little more of an explanation on uh, uh, some of the working functions of that. And we can then have a gradient weighted come where we uh, again look at these post hoc models. And what we were then trying to do is also to uh, apply this on, on digital pathology. And when we're looking at actually um, nuclei, small cells, like very small regions, some of these heat maps actually don't, don't work that well and, and, uh, and don't deliver the results that, uh, uh, that we would like to have. And based on that, uh, we worked with the people who developed the, the, the Lime software. I mean, they um, they had they, they were looking at like the super pixels or larger regions that can then uh, explain what's happening inside the model. So they by removing some of the regions, they checked what is the influence of the different regions for uh, for the decision making. And when we can then check like how this influences the model, and we uh, were then looking uh, by having actually a variety of functions to see what would clinicians actually prefer in terms of the feedback on some of the data that they were getting in terms of the visualizations. What is the entities that, uh, that are actually interesting for them? So we're looking at larger parts, we're looking at cells, then smaller parts, but with uh, not, not the soft uh, heat maps, but rather uh, like uh, much clearer parts that were happening. So we generated a variety of these uh, uh, visualizations and did, then did a small user test where people could actually choose. And it turns out that they really are looking much more into like uh, much sharper parts that uh, uh, that are linked on the cell level. So that correspond not to like larger regions in the image, but really small parts that uh, that are interesting for them. Again, uh, you can check out the paper for, for more of the details on, on these aspects. One thing that um, I would really like to work on more is also like really how we can evaluate explainability because currently much of like when we have a paper on explainability, examples are given, but it's obviously always biased to see like uh, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, um, as it is subjective on what people understand, I think we really need to do user tests. We've done a few user studies, but all on a, on a, on a very small uh, scale. And really looking at what do we want what do we want the systems to actually deliver? I mean, you can explain something well, but then the question is, what is the impact on the decision-making? Is it making people faster in their decision-making because they might be able to better integrate the knowledge that they have? Is it de delivering better decisions? I mean, that's what we optimally want so that they take the best decisions for a patient. Um, the question is also often, I mean, even if the quality of the decisions increases, for example, for diagnosis, does it have an impact on the patient? I mean, many diseases are actually treated in exactly the same way. So sometimes we don't need the granularity that we might actually get by getting better decisions. And then it's also a question of how physicians actually like systems. Quite often, when we, anything we change in a clinical setting, people usually don't like. If it's not well integrated, people don't like it because it makes them slower. Um, so also the question of satisfaction. If people like using a system, then they will use it. They will likely also much better discover the advantages that a system can break. So when we uh, bring, so when we want to do user tests, it's actually quite important to, uh, in, a, in a very detailed way, to check what we uh, would like to, uh, what we would like to evaluate, and how we can then evaluate it also in a prospective way. Um, and then, I mean, here we're getting into computer, human-computer interaction. We've done a couple of user tests with uh, more classical systems, and we're currently planning to, to do that also, integrating not like only the decision support, but also interpretability to see what is the impact and how does the impact change the, uh, the decision-making in this respect. And I mean, now I'm getting to, into some of the things that uh, Osamara has been developing with us. So based on what Ben Kim did with the uh, concept activation factors, so looking at specific uh, detectors for concepts like uh, zebra likeliness and, uh, and similar things, we were looking into how we can integrate that for histo histopathology concepts. So we're looking at nuclei and how different appearances of the nuclei would actually change. And, this is what Mara also mentioned is regression concept vectors as a way to really understand like what's going on. Regression concept vectors is not binary concepts, but really 
we're looking at regression tasks if we have nuclei size, but not, for example, like enlarged nuclei uh, are an indicator, for example, of degeneration that might be linked to cancer, as is the shape. And then we can have like a variety of uh, shape changes in that, or also the internal structure uh, of, uh, of the nuclei. That means that when we use regression concept vectors, we first need to identify what clinicians use. So in that respect, we try to explain to them uh, the working of a deep neural network based on features that the clinician had been using before. This also gives us a very good baseline because we can really compare whether using classical features that they extract manually from the images and look at how well we can explain the decisions that we're taking uh, 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 like what, that a neural network takes with these features that they had been using before and whether the mapping of that actually explains what can be explained in a specific uh, decision task. So here, uh, for example, we, can, we could say that, uh, I don't know, 30% of the decision can be explained with the enlarged nuclei, 20% with uh, the heterogeneous structure, and maybe 10% with uh, uh, the uh, heterogeneity of the outline. Page. And, uh, and I mean, we can, we, can, we can apply, we can annotate data, we can then do that as a post hoc model, get the outputs. One of the things we're losing is the beauty of, uh, uh, of deep learning that uh, we don't need to create handcrafted features. Here again, we're creating something that we actually need to explain the decisions uh, uh, as a post hoc model. Um, so uh, that is sort of one of the things that we're also looking at. How can we actually more automatically identify not only what clinicians have been using so far, but what else would actually be uh, an explanation for uh, a specific outcome in a specific situation based on the model that we're having. Because we're using only what clinicians have been using before, we might not be able to actually identify really interesting findings or something that is linked completely to, to bias that, uh, uh, that we have in the data. And I think that is uh, uh, something we really need to, to look into uh, when we want to deploy that in, in, a, in a larger variety of settings. One of the things that's also interesting here, for example, is that actually nuclei sizes is an important information for uh, what we're doing. If we do use like networks that are pre-trained on, on ImageNet, or what we, I mean, they're trained for being scale invariant. So we actually lo lose this feature. And one of the experiments that was also done by Mara is to actually remove the scale invariance. And we could see that the performance on uh, these tasks in histopathology image classification actually really improved. So we can actually use these type of features as well if we identify problems in the model here at the scale invariance, we can actually move these problems and uh, develop much, uh, much better models. And I mean, th there's criticism, particularly towards like post hoc interpretability that for example, I mean, we're propagating, like if we have an opaque function that we don't really understand, we sort of like just using that to try to, to uh, give explanations, but it would actually be much better to really start with these uh, glass-like models. And I think it's important to, uh, um, to, to, to check like what actually makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what is easy to interpret, what's maybe hard to interpret, and look at all these uh, sort of extreme cases. And that's why also I think that uh, looking at uncertainty information, uh, uh, et cetera, is actually something that's really important. I mean, it's maybe fuzzy information, but it, it's additional information that uh, we can then take into account for the next steps and, uh, and for the decision making. And, and another part that's linked also to the user test that uh, uh, I would like to work on is also looking more at inter in interactive interpretability. So how can a person interact in with the model and with the data to sort of explore things and human intelligence has, I mean, qualitatively we're actually really, really good. And I think um, when we look at different user groups, how people interact with the system, how people give feedback on the system, I think that's where we can, where we can really learn a lot. And I think we might get, uh, if we look at regression concept vectors, also many ideas of additional features that we might want to check that could be able to explain like some of the, uh, the problems or of uh, the good performance that, uh, that we're having here. So here we might, be able to, we might actually need to adapt to different user groups uh, uh, with separate approaches, um, uh, looking at very different aspects that we can, uh, that we can then uh, evaluate in, in that respect. And I mean, I haven't talked too much about the technical aspects, but there's a couple of things that uh, I, uh, I really want to 
uh, stressed because I think it's important when we look at interpretability, not only to look at the technical parts, but really look at like, what is the input of what we're doing? How can we evaluate with real users? Um, we need, I think we need to check with people who run human factors because quite often when, even if we have a bad model, but a good user interface, sometimes people can actually do a lot more with it than we have a very good model, but, but a poor user interface. So I think this whole interactivity, the feedback, uh, looking at it, how explainable AI can actually work with existing systems. I think that's something we need to take into account. Another part that I think is really important for uh, 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 explainable AI is also to look into prospective clinical trials, to look at like, how does it work on, on different data sets? Because that's something, well, like when I put up all of the news of the, the articles, there's quite often it works in the laboratory setting. We were really good in predicting the past, but not so much in predicting the future. And I think that's what we really want. If we want it to work in a clinical setting, we need to work on prospective data, on changing data. We need to identify these problems because that's how we actually learn. That's how we can uh, generate better systems in, 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 in that respect. And I think it's important to do that. And I, th I think it's also good to really look at how we can actually compare approaches, how can we uh, compare different approaches for interpretability, how can we find objective performance measures for that, I mean user tests are always sort of subjective because it depends on your user group, it depends on the number of people you have, but how can we create something that would actually lead to, uh, to uh, a more solid results, quantitative analysis of, uh, of the approaches that, that we're developing. And um, coming to the end, so um, I think that uh, uh, explainable AI interpretability is, is really important for medical decision making. I think it's, it's really important to take it into account when we build decision support, particularly when we use deep learning, but possibly also for other ones. It's very much linked to an integration into existing systems so that people, when like clinicians, when they use a system, they don't lose time with the, uh, with the integration. They don't need to open up a completely different system, but it's they're using it in a, in, a, in a setting that they know, and we can compare it with and without uh, the, uh, uh, the use of it. I think it's um, important that we remove this black box character, that we sort of understand what's happening inside, that we can understand the different parts, that we can understand both the models and the data, and uh, find out like also how, how these things might be changing. I mean, also if we do, use continuous learning. So we update, we're updating our model cons constantly with new data. You also need to check what's, what's changing in the model and how does it affect the results because we're not having something stable in that case anymore. So possibly we're not able to actually reproduce some of the things that, uh, that we could see before. So maybe uh, with the new model, some of the past cases might get, get different results. And we, we need to pay attention to, to, uh, to that as well. We need to look at robustness. So, what is like, uh, it's not pure performance that counts, but also that, uh, that we're having something that we can re re rely on. We don't have like any uh, really problematic mistakes in that. And so th thank you very much for your attention. And uh, you can find more information on our webpage and also all of the publications uh, that I've mentioned should be on our publication server. And I, I have like I will make the slides available so many of the references I I put in the slides are also available at the end of the slides. Thank you very much.